During the Persian Gulf War, an elite team of British SAS commandos infiltrates Iraq. Their mission, to disable a network of mobile Scud missile launchers. The team is compromised, deep behind enemy lines. With 120 miles to the border and the Iraqi army at their backs, the men of Bravo 2-0 face a new mission, to survive. In an era of global violence, a new breed of warrior has emerged to counter the threat. Superbly trained, fearless, and equipped with massive firepower, these men are an elite few. Their teams are hand-picked, their operations covert, their missions deadly. From around the globe, these are the untold stories of the special forces. On January 17, 1991, a U.S.-led coalition launched a massive air war in response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Operation Desert Storm had begun. Laser and satellite-guided missiles dramatically reduced the risk of Allied casualties. It promised to be a clean, high-tech war. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein vowed to retaliate. He unleashed wave after wave of Scud missiles at cities in Israel and Saudi Arabia. Airstrikes proved useless against the Scuds. The missiles were mounted on mobile launchers and eluded aerial surveillance. The coalition would have to fight the Scuds the old-fashioned way, with men on the ground. All right, let's carry on, but listen up. This is the information. A mission this dangerous required a high level of training. Team Bravo 2-0 of the British SAS was briefed at a forward operating base. Efforts by the coalition air forces to suppress the Iraqi launches of Scud missiles against Israel and Saudi Arabia have been a failure thus far. Formed in World War II, the SAS, or Special Air Service, is the most experienced special forces unit in the world. Key portions of the targets, most notable... The eight men of Bravo 2-0 would be dropped behind enemy lines for 10 days. Their mission, to track mobile Scud launchers along a major supply route, or MSR. Andy, can I have a word? Sergeant Andy McNabb would lead the dangerous operation. He and his men were also ordered to destroy a fiber optic cable running alongside the MSR. Fiber optic cables. Wait, it was a crucial target. The cable linked Scud missile launchers to Iraqi command and control. To sever that link, they first had to find it. Andy McNabb's identity is protected for security reasons. The problem was there was no information, very little mapping, and no satellite imagery of the area that we we're going to operate in. You've just got to get out there. And the argument is, well, that's what special forces do. Sometimes they go in without any information whatsoever because they're there to gather it. When you land, find a lie-up position with close proximity to the main supply route. You're going to have to dig into the sand to create your LUP. The flat desert terrain would offer little cover. The squad would have to dig trenches, or lie-up positions, to hide in. Once we got on the ground, our biggest weapon would be concealment. We're not going to be moving in the daylight. What we're going to be doing is hiding up in a lie-up position, an LUP, in the daylight hours. During the night, we would then go out and operate. If we haven't heard from you within 48 hours, make your way back to the rendezvous point right here, and we'll have a helicopter there ready to come and meet you. The way that we operate is in small groups, maybe four, eight, 12 men, going in for a surgical strike uh, to hit a target and get in there quickly and come out even quicker. Bravo 2-0 geared up 
and prep the mission. Every body in that patrol, all eight of us, get in, we start and plan and prepare the operation. Because of everybody's background being so different, teamwork is so important. At 24, Bob was the youngest member of the team. He had been in the SAS six months. Chris Ryan, a six-year veteran, was the unit's medic. Mike joined the SAS from New Zealand. Stan, an Australian, was a demolition expert. From a commander's point of view, you're getting a lot of different types of experiences. Everybody feels that they're part of the job. Vince brought 20 years of experience to the team. Dinger had specialized training as a paratrooper. Steve Lane, known as Legs, was Bravo 20's communications expert. The team would use a short burst radio to stay in touch with headquarters in Saudi Arabia. This radio is designed to prevent enemy eavesdropping. As a backup, they also carried a TAC B, a limited range emergency radio. For navigation, they packed a Global Positioning Satellite Device, or GPS. On January 22nd, the SAS boarded a helicopter for the flight into Iraq. Chris Ryan had no illusions about the nature of the mission. It was quite a, an emotional event because I think everybody had a fair idea that this was going to be a one-way ticket. So we set off farewells, got on board the helicopter, and then flew into Iraq. Looking out the windows, you, you know, you could see feet. quite far and, and the ground was very flat. Uh, the ambient light was, was very good. The helicopter raced 20 yards off the ground to avoid enemy radar. The helicopter didn't have any armaments on. I mean, the crew were very brave. If we downed the aircraft, that they were just to attach themselves to us and we would, we would bring them out. Uh, these lads hadn't been trained in escape and evasion or anything, so... You know, they were, they were taking a huge risk. As soon as we got touchdown, the drill is you get off the back and just lie down and wait till the helicopter takes off, wait till the noise dies down, and you get your, your hearing back, your night vision, everything. So we got two of the guys with the guns left and right, and then once we settled down, um, basically, um, there was nothing around it, just still, we, we hadn't been compromised. Andy used the GPS and a map to plot their position. The team had landed just over a mile from their destination, a major Iraqi supply route, or MSR. Single file on me. The commandos were heavily armed. They carried M16s outfitted with grenade launchers and powerful anti-tank weapons. Their belt kits were packed with enough ammunition to last them two weeks. The other essentials, food, water, and digging equipment, were carried in heavy bergens on their backs. We were using an Allied bombing raid that was going on in an airfield about sort of 15 kilometers away as cover to get us in. It's not our problem, Chris. Let's just get on with it, all right? By 4.45 a.m., the patrol reached the main supply route. Instead of soft desert sand, they found solid rock. Andy, come on, bedrock. All you had was a couple of inches of sand, and then underneath was bedrock. It was a nightmare. 
But again, that's tough. You're there, you still gotta get on with it. Gotcha. Stan, Dinger, Mark, on me. Andy took a small group to scout for another hiding place. Right, let's tell you what. The others stayed behind to guard the gear. The recon team located a dry riverbed. It wouldn't provide much cover, but with dawn approaching, it was all they had. This will do. Let's go get the others. The men hunkered down and tried to stay warm. What was supposed to be this? Despite all the gear they carried, they were not prepared for bad weather. It was the worst winter Iraq was having in 30 years. It was very, very cold. It was a high wind chill factor also. At dawn, Bob scanned the perimeter for potential threats. The area was clear. No problem, man. Andy needed to contact SAS headquarters. Legs sent the message via short burst radio. Anything? It's not going through. Something's wrong with the signal. It's all typed in. It's not, it's not transmitting. Also, Andy. The radio wasn't working. In the rush to deploy, it had been encrypted with the wrong frequencies. All right, boys, I said it's the radio. It's nothing to do with us. We'll do an exchange, all right? Andy was unconcerned. The team had planned for contingencies. If they failed to establish communications within 48 hours, headquarters would send a helicopter to a prearranged rendezvous point. The plan was that four o'clock that following morning, a helicopter would be there. So that was no problems. We're still gonna be operating. We'll get a new radio and we'll carry on. The communications breakdown was a nuisance, but the mission plan was intact. They had to find the fiber optic cable. The problems that we had was that we didn't exactly know how it was marked. Um, we didn't know if it was um, above ground in concrete piping or buried underground with markers. We didn't have a clue. At nightfall, Andy led a small reconnaissance patrol to search for the cable. Along the way, they encountered an Iraqi anti-aircraft position. It was a tempting target. But our job is not to go in there and take them on, is not to go in there and find out what they are. Our job is to find the optic cable. So anything animal or human, we avoid. Let's box around. They moved carefully around the Iraqis. Near dawn, the recon patrol found what they were looking for. There were some white stakes that were stuck into the ground, which we assume might be the markers uh, for the cable. But as the night goes on, we were starting to get to uh, first light again, so we had to get back into the hide before daylight. It was too late to try to destroy the cable. They would return the following night. The next morning, the SAS had company. About 400 meters away, the other side of the MSR, the main supply route, there was an anti-aircraft site. And what we presume, it was the guys we met the night before that have driven to their position. It didn't present a problem to us at that time, purely because uh, we were hidden. Uh, they're not going to send out clearing patrols. They're so far in their, their own country. 
So there was no change to the plan. They would wait out the day, hit the target that night, and then pick up the new radio. We started to hear uh, goats moving across the high ground, you know, just about five meters above us. Then after a few minutes, the head goat with a bill, you know, where every other goat sort of follows, came over and looked over the dip on the ground and looked down at us. And then we could hear a small child's voice, you know, maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, you know, I don't know. And it's then when he saw us, and we sort of stopped. We looked at him, he looked at us, and his sort of eyes opened up uh, like saucers. Want some chocolate? Chocolate. And then straight away just started to run and shout, running towards the guns. Their position had been compromised. The commandos prepared to move out. They removed all non-essential gear and loaded up on water. Let's go. They would have to move fast. If the Iraqi soldiers discovered them, it was prison, torture, or death. In early 1991, a US-led coalition launched Operation Desert Storm. Three days later, an elite team of British SAS commandos infiltrated Iraq. Their mission, to disable the enemy's Scud missile system. But within 24 hours, the team's hiding place was compromised. A platoon of Iraqi soldiers was camped 200 yards away. The commandos had extensive training in escape and evasion. A dry riverbed, or wadi, provided an escape route. Chris Ryan, the team's medic, took the point. And we kept to the left-hand side of the wadi uh, whilst we're walking out in single file to keep out a view of the anti-aircraft positions. And what we'd done is we'd put our shamags over our faces to cover our faces, thinking that we could possibly bluff them. They were probably the last people to think that there was coalition forces this, this deep inside of, uh, of Iraq. Sergeant Andy McNabb was commander of the unit. And then all of a sudden, to our left, coming from the area of the, of the, of the MSR, we heard tracked vehicles. Halt! Stand your ground! Can anyone hear it? I can't see it! What are we going to do? Are we going to keep on moving and outrun them? That's not going to happen. Or are we going to stand our ground? And, and the commander did was stand your ground, because there's nothing else to do. And then it kicked off. Everybody's then in their own world. They know what they've got to do. They know that everybody's depending on everyone else. If you've got well-trained troops, they get on with it. The only way to get out of an ambush is face it and go for it. The fire was coming in quite intense. And I can remember looking down at my chest, expecting to see a hole appear or, you know, a body part be taken off. At some point during the contact, we'd moved into view of the anti-aircraft positions, and then they started to open up on us. After that, it was a matter of taking control. What we're doing is trying to stop these people from killing us so we can run away and use the cover of darkness to hide us. So it was literally moving as fast as we can out of the area. The SAS decimated the entire Iraqi platoon with superior firepower. They were now fugitives in a hostile country. We got over the high ground 
I can't believe it, but the, 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 there was the eight members there, we were all there, nobody being injured. When we got across there, I was half expecting one of, at least one of the lads to have been hit. By nightfall, the team had covered eight miles. What about the radio, Lynx? I had to, I had to trap it. It's not a problem. That's it. To make distance between us and the Iraqis after that firefight and the contact, we ditched our Bergens, our equipment. All we had left was our belt kit, and that you know carries the most important things, which is ammunition and water. Throughout the night, Iraqi patrols methodically searched the desert. Andy McNabb intended to throw them off course. The fact that we've had this contact, the Iraqis will naturally think we're going south, we're going towards Saudi, and that's where the emergency RV was. So even if the helicopter did get in, will it be able to pick us up? If we're getting pursued south during the night, do we have to try to get extracted whilst having a firefight? If that happens, the helicopter won't come in. It's as simple as that. A helicopter rescue was now impossible. It was too dangerous to land. The team's only hope okay. was to escape into Syria. According to the map, the border was 110 miles northwest of their position. And he estimated it would take them three nights on foot. Once we realized we were in an escape and evasion situation, uh, our mindset just, just changed and we all accepted that we are now on the run. We were probably in the worst place in the world to escape. It was uh, flatbed rock, there wasn't any cover, there was no foliage to disappear into, there was no water, um, and the ground was very hard to travel over and to navigate over as well. 30 miles into their journey, Andy noticed that Vince and Stan were falling behind. Vince, what's wrong with the leg? Vince had injured his leg during the firefight. Chris, Dinger, take Vince's weapon. He was too weak to carry his weapon. Stan was starting to dehydrate. We stopped, we rested, got fluids down him, helped Vince and the, and the leg injuries as, as much as possible. I put them in front of me, and then I put Chris out in front as the lead scout. As the SAS headed north, they encountered a new threat, hypothermia. During that night, the weather had become horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. There was a, there was a, a fearsome wind that, that was blowing and, and started to get extremely, extremely cold. As the temperature dipped below zero, the men were in danger of freezing to death. Our hands were starting to uh, freeze up and the shemags that we wore to um, uh, cover us from the, uh, uh, from the wind started to freeze up where our moisture was coming through with breathing. Over the roar of the wind, Andy barely made out the sound of Allied aircraft overhead. Gotta stop and try to attack me! He told Vince to stop and to pass the message down the line. He wanted to use their emergency radio to contact a passing jet. Hello, any calls, sir? This is Bravo 2 0. Bravo 2 0. We are a ground call sign. Call that. We're in trouble. Over. Okay, sir. Bravo 2 0. You're very weak. Turn back north! Turn back north! And then Over. the signal faded. At that time, it was great, because what it meant was that they were aware that this call sign Bravo 20, they could work out where we roughly were and that we existed and were in trouble. Andy turned to tell Vince, but he was gone. Visibility was poor. They could see nothing but blowing sand. Where have they gone? Where have they gone? Please, stop! 
Chris, Stan, and Vince had vanished. Two of them were injured. They would be lost without the GPS. As the temperature dipped below zero, Andy knew they had to be found, and quickly. Chris! Vince! During the Persian Gulf War, eight members of the British SAS were trapped behind enemy lines. Pursued by Iraqi patrols, battling icy winds, the team struggled to make it to the Syrian border. Gotta stop and try the attack bay. Sergeant Andy McNabb lost three of his men when he stopped to use the emergency radio. The patrol had split in two, and it was my fault. What I'd done, I told Vince that we were gonna stop expecting him to pass it on the line, so everybody knew what was going on. But what he didn't appreciate was how bad a condition he was, and he didn't confirm that he was going to pass it on. He just carried on moving. A search for the missing men proved futile. Visibility was extremely low. And he couldn't risk the lives of the rest of the team. The three guys that, that were split from us five, they knew the bearing that they were going on. They knew what the plan was to get to Syria. Uh, they're all professional soldiers. Two of them are injured, um, but they're still alive. They, they know what they got to do. It took Chris Ryan nearly an hour to realize they had separated from the group. All three soldiers were delirious with hypothermia. All I know had turned around. I had Stan and I had Vince, and the rest of the patrol had uh, disappeared. Where's the rest of the patrol? I don't know. We lost them. They split off somewhere. Chris, the medic, was now responsible for two injured soldiers. I had a night sight, which I could uh, view. Um, where we come from, we couldn't see any of the guys, uh, couldn't, couldn't make out anybody. I was quite worried and frightened now because there's three of us uh, with two, two weapons. The other group of five had a, a GPS and, uh, and the machine guns. Chris urged Vince and Stan on. The Euphrates River was 70 miles northwest, a two-day hike. There they would refill their canteens and cross the border into Syria. But for now, they needed a place to hide. Just before daybreak, we came across an old tank of merm, and it made an indentation in the ground, which was like a little ditch. So we got in there uh, and used that as, as cover. I had a look around uh, as uh, daylight uh, came up and uh, I could see a box-bodied vehicle with at least two uh, Iraqis around it. All they could do was keep still and hope they were not discovered. The wind chill was severe. Chris and his men were in danger. And I've worked in some of the coldest places on this earth and that day was the longest day in my life. Uh, we were freezing. We're freezing to death. Andy's group wasn't faring much better. A burial mound provided minimal cover. Iraqi troops were everywhere. It was obvious there was far more enemy activity than we initially thought. And what was happening was that vehicles were stopping and troops were getting out. Now, whether they were looking for us or whether it was, it was speculative searching, we don't really know. I personally was getting quite concerned because it was either the weather or the Iraqis were going to kill us. It was going to be one or the other. Andy spotted a paved road a half mile from their position. If they could make it that far without being seen, they could try to hijack a vehicle. At nightfall, they would sneak down to the road. 
But for now, they had to survive another day of sub-zero temperatures. Chris and his team left the tank berm as soon as it got dark. There was no let up in the storm. Stan had recovered from serious dehydration. But Vince seemed to be getting worse. You're going to have to slow down. I need a rest. Vince, you can't rest. We're going to keep moving. The bitter wind kept their body temperatures dangerously low. During that night, uh, Vince kept falling, falling behind. He went through all the classic uh, signs of, of hypothermia, uh, from being uh, shouting, screaming, to wanting to lie down and sleep. Chris knew they couldn't survive these conditions much longer. Hey, we're coming off. The men were already disoriented. It was a struggle to stay on course. Andy and his men reached the road. The storm had finally passed over them. After hours of waiting, they saw headlights in the distance. If they wanted to get out of Iraq alive, it was now or never. During Operation Desert Storm, three British SAS commandos were separated from their unit behind enemy lines. A winter storm hampered navigation. Hypothermia quickly set in. Vince, the most experienced of the three commandos, had been injured in a firefight. Now he struggled to keep up. By the time Chris and Stan realized their teammate was missing, it was too late. There was no sign of him. The situation was desperate. With Iraqi patrols closing in, Chris Ryan had a difficult decision to make. We called off the search, Vince, because we were walking back into enemy territory. Um, Vince may have walked off to the left or right, and he could be wandering anywhere. I know in my heart of hearts that man probably lay down and went to sleep, and he died that night. Chris and Stan had to go on. It was 54 miles to the Syrian border. Out of range of the storm, the rest of the unit staked out a road. Sergeant Andy McNabb and his men were in bad shape, but they had a plan. If they could hijack a vehicle, they could drive across the border. So I got out on the road and start to uh, wave the vehicle down as the headlights approached. What it was was a, a 1960s New York taxi cab. I couldn't believe it. The SAS drove northwest. They were now just 35 miles from the border. Not far away, Chris and Stan were in trouble. Both men were dehydrated and exhausted. An Iraqi shepherd approached their position. In desperation, Stan blew their cover. The commandos needed a vehicle. This lad couldn't speak English and we, we couldn't speak any Arabic. And uh, Stan was asking him, did he have a vehicle and, uh, or a tractor? Tractor? How far to walk? How far to walk? He's just saying yes to everything. Listen. 
Listen, I'll take him and see if we can get trapped. Stan insisted on taking the Shepherd in search of a vehicle. I was against it because it was breaking SOPs. Stan left his weapon and webbing with me. And I said, I'll be leaving this uh, location at 6.30. If you're not back, you know, I'm going. Hold on to it, Stan. And I said, if you change your mind, just shoot this guy and come back. By now, Andy and the rest of the team were approaching the border. With no Iraqi patrols in sight, it looked as if the carjacking had paid off. Chris's situation was grim. It was nearly dawn, and Stan had not returned. He needed a place to hide. I looked over my shoulder, and uh, there was a set of lights. And I thought, "Pray, he must have gotten a vehicle." And uh, you know, he was right, and I, I was wrong. And within a short period of time, there was a second set of lights. Chris knew he was in trouble. First vehicle came uh, to within about uh, probably no more than 100 meters. I moved forward and put a burst into each vehicle. And then just basically turned around and then started legging it back uh, in the direction that I'd been. There was nothing came out of them. Uh, there was no returning fire, nothing. Chris Ryan was now on his own. Sergeant Andy McNabb and his men were seven miles from Syria and safety. We had no definite sort of road system. So basically, we were heading northwest. So as we drove along uh, the road, if we came to a junction, Whatever was going northwest or in that general direction, we'll take it and just keep on trying to get to that border. We eventually got within 11 kilometers of the, of the border where we got uh, caught in a line of traffic for a uh, vehicle checkpoint. Iraqi soldiers were moving down the line of trucks and uh, oil tankers and vehicles. Eventually, they would come to our taxi. And then we just started running, and we started running west um, to get out of the area and get towards the border. We, you know, we could almost taste the border. Standing between the SAS and the border was the Euphrates River. Once we get out of the confusion, stop, consolidate, so we can get over the border that night. Exactly. 10 k's to the border. OK, Mark. Reggie, on me. Let's go. Andy and Mark reconned the river, looking for the narrowest point. Because we knew if we didn't cross it, we'd die. Far too much activity, far too much. They discovered an Iraqi patrol on top of their position. At the sound of gunfire, the rest of the team scattered. Legs and Dinger ran out of ammunition. They decided to swim for it. Bob was forced into the open and gunned down. Legs and Dinger made it to the opposite bank of the Euphrates. The half-mile swim in freezing water nearly finished them both. Andy and Mark were now low on ammo themselves. They made a break for the tree line. 
And as we came over the, uh, the lip and started to move forward, uh, we was opened up on, uh, from about five metres away. Andy's clip ran empty. Mark was hit. Now, Andy's only defense was the darkness. I boxed around the position and then just carried on for the, uh, for the border. On the opposite side of the river, Dinger dragged Legs Lane to an old farm shed. Legs was barely conscious. He could go no further. A few minutes later, several Iraqis approached the shed. Some of them carried AK-47s. There was only one thing Dinger could do to save them both. He tried to escape, drawing the Iraqis away from the shed. Despite Dinger's sacrifice, Legs was too far gone. He died later that night. Chris struggled to keep going. I had still my uh, M16 with uh, two or three rounds and the ammunition. Basically, uh, from that point, uh, I was just legging it. Uh, I, need, I knew I needed to get some water. Uh, I hadn't drank in, uh, in two days. Um, and basically, the, the vast majority of that night was spent just heading towards the Euphrates. Daylight forced Andy McNabb into hiding just one and a half miles from the Syrian border. I got under uh, a drainage culvert, which was basically a ditch with a half-inch steel plate across it, which made a bridge. And, um, and all day, there were vehicles moving over. Last night's firefight had the Iraqis scouring the desert for miles around. They searched every possible hiding place. And you could see boots come down and rifles poking in the, uh, in the culvert. Uh, two guys dragged me out, and they dragged me out. I was on my back. As I looked, I could see the high ground of Syria, which I couldn't see because obviously I found the hiding place at the last light, so I didn't see it. So it was so close, I could always taste it. Andy was taken to a military camp near Baghdad. Iraqi intelligence had learned that over the last five days, British commandos had killed 250 of their soldiers. Now they wanted revenge. Andy knew the Iraqis would stop at nothing to uncover the SAS mission. Sergeant Andy McNabb of the British SAS had been captured behind enemy lines. He was taken to a military camp deep inside Iraq. He learned that two other members of his squad were also there. Stan had been caught trying to commandeer a vehicle. Dinger had risked capture to save his teammate, Legs Lane. Now, all three commandos faced torture by Iraqi interrogators. Know some things. During the time in the interrogation center, certainly after the first four or five days, I thought, there's no way we're going to get out of this. We're, we're, we're dead. We're all soldiers here. His training had prepared him for physical and psychological torture. So you've got to accept what's ever happened to you physically. What you're trying to do is be the gray man, 
not be any obstruction, not try and, and be aggressive. You know, you're just trying to just trying to go with the flow and, and keep that mental integrity. We're not making much progress, Andy. Andy finally offered interrogators a cover story. They were medics separated from their unit. The Iraqis weren't satisfied. Chris Ryan was the only member of the team who had not been killed or captured. U.S. fighter jets were bombing a military installation near his position. The young medic was running out of time. At this point, I knew I was in trouble uh, the way my body was. I mean, I've smelled dead bodies before, and I've been on exercise where I haven't washed for three months, and it, your body gives a, a particular smell. Now, when I squeezed my fingernails, there was pus coming out of them. As I said, all my teeth were loose now. There was bleeding. My, my feet were in a, in a dreadful state. Uh, the sores were open on my body. I was quite worried. I didn't know how far I could actually go on. Syria. At dawn, Chris approached a small farm. Syria. Chris Ryan had achieved the impossible. Without food or clean water, he walked 180 miles in seven nights to reach the safety of Syria. At the same time, three of his teammates were being held in a prison near Baghdad. Their situation was grim. God. The cells were filthy and freezing. I want to speak to your officer. The beatings came more often. I want to speak to your officer. After eight days of torture, Andy decided his men had held out long enough. I'm a member of a close observation platoon. Andy told the officer a modified version of the truth. They already knew much of the information he gave them, and this helped verify his story. Myself, Dinger, and, and Stan were put into the same cell. For me, it was, it was fantastic. It was good, as we had time to, to sort of debrief. And, and work, try and work out what had happened. In late January, Saddam Hussein revealed he was using US and British POWs as human shields. He hoped to protect his military installations against air attacks. The US-led coalition countered with the most intense ground war since Vietnam. In two short days, coalition troops demolished what was left of Hussein's army. The Iraqi dictator quickly conceded defeat. On February 26, 1991, he agreed to withdraw his troops from Kuwait completely. The coalition demanded the freedom of all POWs. The imprisoned SAS commandos were released 10 days later. At the Red Cross station in Baghdad, Andy was surprised to find Mark alive. He had only been wounded in the firefight. Five members of the team survived, three did not. Bob Consiglio, Vince Phillips, and Legs Lane were killed in action. The men of Bravo 2-0 risked everything to accomplish their mission. Their courage and their sacrifice will never be forgotten. <laughs>